All right, so the next chapter is all about a, uh, a new type of spectroscopy called uh, NMR spectroscopy, that's nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. This is actually the same technology that's used in MRIs. Has anybody had an MRI done? Do you know why they don't call them NMRs in hospitals? Yeah, because nuclear scares people, but it's the same technology. It doesn't involve uh, any harmful radiation. It's all electromagnetic radiation that's in the form of radio waves. So it's actually quite safe. All right, so the idea behind this form of spectroscopy is that all nuclei with an odd mass number have spin. So let's make a note of that. an odd mass number have spin. All right, so what's an example of a nuclei that we might encounter in organic chemistry that has an odd mass number? Nitrogen. nitrogen. So nitrogen, if we look at the periodic table, it has an atomic mass an average atomic mass of 14.01, which implies that most nitrogen is nitrogen-14, meaning we can't see most nitrogen. However, we could maybe see nitrogen-15. The problem with this is it's a trace, meaning it's hard to see. But there are actually experiments you can do where you can see nitrogen-15 using NMR. What's another isotope we could see that has an odd mass number that's common in organic chemistry? Carbon. It's not going to be carbon-12, it's going to be carbon-13. We did say that this is 1.1% abundant, right? So carbon-13, yeah, we've got some of it around us, but it's only 1.1% of the carbon. All right, what's another isotope that's odd mass number? Hydrogen, right? Specifically, protons, right? So if we've got protons, we can see them with NMR. And the good thing with this is that it is very abundant. So during the course of this chapter, the two that we're primarily going to look at are going to be these two, carbon-13 and proton NMR. We're really not going to get into other isotopes, primarily because they tend to be trace isotopes or they're just less commonly run as experiments. All right, so let's take this idea that they have spin, right? So what does it mean when a nuclei has spin? Well, a nucleus, right, has a positive charge. We can think of this positive charge as being in the nucleus, this densely charged center of an atom and if it's spinning around like this kind of like a top what do you think happens if we have a charge that's spinning for those of you that took physics makes a magnetic field right if you have a spinning charge you can actually create a miniature magnetic field so in this case we're going to get this magnetic field essentially forming around this spinning charge looks like this So what we'll have is a north pole kind of at one end, and we'll have a south pole at another. So these nuclei behave almost like little magnets in space, which is kind of cool. So the picture over on the right-hand side represents the magnetic field with an arrow. So we have north poles and south poles off of each of these, and they're kind of just spinning around in space. So that's what's going on here. So the question is, how can we utilize this unusual feature to um, gain information about a molecule. So what I'll do is I'll show you a few demonstrations about how resonance plays into this. So what I've got here is a cool interactive demo. So like I said, atoms that spin have this miniature north pole and south pole, so they in many ways behave like a, or a, a compass, right? Where the compass tries to align in a magnetic field. So what we could do is we can actually change the magnetic field that's being applied, right? So we could apply a magnetic field to the top and bottom, or we could not apply a magnetic field. So the idea with this is if we apply a magnetic field, is this going to spin around in space very easily? No, it's essentially going to be locked into a stronger magnetic field, right? So if we apply a strong enough magnetic field, we can actually align the magnetic field of all of the different nuclei, right? Because magnets want to be oriented with other magnets. So the North Pole of this nuclei is kind of the red end of that compass needle. It's aligning with the opposite pole of the external magnet. Make sense? Okay, so that's what we're doing here. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna adjust this to 
two mega tesla so that's the strength of the ex external magnet i'm just kind of spreading it out a little bit so the field isn't super strong all right next what we're going to do is we're going to start applying a magnetic field horizontally specifically an electromagnetic field so what i'm going to do let me turn off all the lights so it's easier to see is i'm going to throw in this magnet and you see if we apply a horizontal magnet we can actually knock it off access right so this is kind of disturbing the other magnetic field so what we can do is we can actually hit this at a certain frequency and get this to essentially rock in space so the goal is to align your nuclei in a, a, a magnetic field that's really strong and then try to knock it off axis with the horizontal field so if we think about this we could do this a few different ways so let's imagine in this one that I'm going to set this to 1 and I'm going to set the frequency to 0.1. So we've got the nuclei kind of getting a little bit rocked off axis, but what do you think the problem is? It's going way too slow, right? So we can go ahead and we can try to speed up the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation. So what I'm going to do for this one is I'm going to increase it all the way to 1 hertz. All right? So now I've increased the frequency. What's the problem now? It's too fast. So we're not hitting the resonant frequency where we can really knock this off axis so that it almost spins around to a 90 degree angle. So what we do is we have to find the appropriate frequency where we can really start knocking this off axis. So for example, I'm at 0.35 hertz. And in this case, it looks like it's pretty close to the resonant frequency. You see how I'm almost getting that needle to go 90 degrees off axis with the master magnetic field going north and south? That would be defined as the resonant frequency for this nuclei. And the resonant frequency for nuclei of a specific type typically show up in a window of frequencies. However, they're not always going to be the same. It depends on the location of that specific nuclei as well as the identity of the nuclei. So it does seem kind of physics-y, but let's imagine what happens when we knock it off axis. So let's say we knock it off axis to 90 degrees, and then we just stop the magnetic pulsing. Essentially what happens is it will swing back into the magnetic field. So it will spin back into that up and down magnetic field. So the question is, well, what information can we learn when this goes back into the magnetic field? Actually, quite a bit. We're not going to get into the math behind this because, quite simply, I don't understand it. <laughs> but let's summarize what's going on. So we align nuclei in a magnetic field. That's the first thing that we do. And then a second EM pulse, meaning electromagnetic pulse, knocks the nuclei off axis. And then we say that a detector records the relaxation. All right, so what we see in this detector, sorry, let me zoom out, is something that looks like this on a graph. We've got time down here. That's the time of the relaxation period. And then over here, we're going to essentially have um, the energy level that's um, being detected by the detector. So when it's 90 degrees off axis, there's a lot of energy. So it's essentially going to go like this. And then over time, it's essentially just going to relax back into that magnetic field. Does that make sense? This is called a free induction decay. This is usually just referred to as an FID spectrum. And FID spectrum, they don't really tell you that much information. It's way too complicated for any human being to interpret. So instead, what we do is we use a secondary computer program 
that will do a Fourier transformation on this and actually give you interpretable data. We're not going to get into that. Instead, we just trust that the computer does it correctly for us. So next week when we get into lab, I'll show you the free induction decay on the computer. We'll switch programs. That second program will actually process the data, and then we'll look at the data after it's been transformed. But I just wanted to give you an idea of what's going on in the uh, physics world behind here. Yeah. Yeah, that's energy. So when you knock it off axis, there's a large amount of potential energy. And then as it starts relaxing back in, that potential energy goes down. Yep. All right. So a lot of people ask me, do we really need to have a solid grasp of the physics behind this? Not exactly. I just want to make sure that you understand where we're coming from with the spectroscopy. So now let's get into the nitty gritty behind NMR. So the first thing I always do is ask students to determine the number of possible signals for a given molecule. So let's kind of break this down. So nuclei in the same chemical environment have the same resonant frequency. That is another way of saying that they share the same signal because they perfectly overlap with one another. So this is kind of useful. So let's take a look at an example molecule here. This has two chlorines and two hydrogens. And I'm going to call this hydrogen HA and this one HB. What's the name of this molecule? Actually, it has two different names that we could call it. What do you think? Methylene dichloride. So it would either, either be methylene chloride. That's one common name. What's another common name for this? Dichloromethane. Dichloromethane. They're both used interchangeably. So my question here is, is HA, meaning this proton right here, in the same chemical environment as HB, or are they in different chemical environments? Why or why not? See if you agree with your neighbor. Do you think HA is in the same environment as HB, or is it in a different environment? All right, let's see a show of hands. If you think they're in the same environment, raise your hand. All right, you're correct. So in this case, HA and HB are actually in the same environment. If you imagine being that proton HA in space and you look around and see what's around you in space, you'd actually have the exact same view as if you're HB, right? Because HB, if you look one direction, you're like, hey, I'm next to two chlorines. The other direction, I'm next to a hydrogen. If you're HA, you're actually seeing the exact same thing. So they will share the same signal. So let's make a note of that. So HA, let me color code it, and HB are in the same environment. Meaning they will share the same signal. So that's pretty important to remember is that even though you've got two different protons there, they're chemically equivalent to one another, therefore you'll only have one signal for the both of them. All right, let's compare this. So nuclei in different chemical environments will have different chemical frequencies or different resonant frequencies. Whoops, sorry. All right, so let's take an example here. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to draw out all of the different atoms here. 
we'll take a look at what's going on. So in this case, we've got a bunch of hydrogens. We've got an oxygen in the center. My question for you is, let's take a look at this proton right here, HA. Are there any other protons in the same chemical environment as HA? What do you think? The one on the other side. I heard somebody say this one. Why is this in the same chemical environment? Well, let's think about it this way, right? You see how there's a plane of symmetry kind of cutting this molecule in half? That means that the molecule, or sorry, the proton on the left-hand side is going to be in the same environment as the right-hand side due to symmetry, right? Yep. Yeah, so let's see if we can identify any more. So you, are you saying, what about this one? Yeah, that's a good question. Do you think these are in the same chemical environment? I'll give you a hint. These bonds can rotate really, really fast in space, right? We talked about that first term. Sigma bonds can rotate freely in space. That means that the methyl group, that CH3 group, is going to spin around like a helicopter blade. So the question is, are they in the same environment at a snapshot in time? Kind of not, right? However, imagine that you're taking a picture, right, of a helicopter spinning in space. Will that picture show individual helicopter blades? It depends on the shutter speed, right? So if you have a really good camera with really good shutter speed, meaning high, uh, high frequency of taking pictures, then maybe you could. However, if you've got a slower shutter speed, what will it look like for a helicopter blade? A blur, right? So in this case, the question is, does NMR take a snapshot instantaneous picture, or is it more of an average of a time period? What do you think? Average of a time period. So in this case, these will show up in the same chemical environment. And like I tell people, try to imagine these spinning around like helicopter blades. They're spinning so fast, fast they're blurring together during the snapshot that we're viewing them. All right, so I would agree that this is in the same chemical environment. All right, with that in mind, are there any others like that? Yeah, exactly. All of these methyl group protons on the left and right hand side are going to be in the same chemical environment, right? Because not only are they spinning around like helicopter blades and blurring together, but we have a plane of symmetry where the left hand group is the same as the right hand group. So kind of crazy. All six of these protons will share the same signal. All right, now let's go to the next one. Are there any others like HB? Yeah, we could say, well, based on symmetry, the other side's got to be that one. All right, what about the remaining two? So we have a plane of symmetry cutting it straight down the middle. What if we cut the page kind of in half, so cut down the page? They would actually be equivalent. They'd be mirror image front and back, right? So another way of thinking about this is if this is a wedge and that's a dash, then we are really reflecting one another in space. So we could say, well, both of these must be HB because the wedge is essentially a reflection of that giving dash. Does that make sense? All right. So in this case, we can make some assumptions. HA is in a different environment. than HB. Therefore, we would get two proton signals in NMR. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a really good question. So the question was, is this HB really closer to the oxygen than this HB? What do you think? Because they're tetrahedral, they're actually both equidistant to that oxygen. It's just really hard to show that two-dimensionally on paper, which is why we use dashes and wedges. It's hard to show three-dimensionality on paper, so instead we just use dashes and wedges. Good question, though. All right, so now challenge question. We said we can look at nuclei with odd mass numbers, right? So let's consider the carbons now. How many carbon signals would you expect? Two, right? Because if we think about this carbon over here, it's going to be the same as that carbon over there, right, due to symmetry. And then over here, we could say, well, this carbon 
is going to be the same as that carbon. So we could go ahead and say we would expect two carbon signals as well. Yeah, so that's a good question. It has to be carbon-13 to be viewed by NMR. That means that every sample that you have, there's some statistical probability that any one of those carbons will be carbon-13. There's a 1.1% probability. However, when you're taking a sample, you're looking at billions and billions and billions and billions of molecules, which means you'll actually see some of that carbon-13. It just takes longer to run your uh, scan, if that makes sense. All right, so this gets a little bit tricky as we go along. So let's try another one. All right, let's do everybody's favorite alcohol, ethanol. And I'm going to go ahead and show all of the atoms here just so we're super clear and that we don't, don't neglect anything. All right, so first question is number of... Proton signals. So check with your neighbor, and then separately we'll do number of carbon-13 signals. All right, so let's try the proton one. Show me with your fingers how many signals you would expect for this one. <laughs> so I'm seeing some threes and some fives. So let's check. All right, so I'm just going to pick one. This HA, are there any others like it? Yeah, in fact, all of the CH3 ones are going to be the same. Like I said, this is like a miniature helicopter blade. This bond is going to spin around in space really, really fast. When we take our picture using the NMR, it's going to blur together. All right, now we'll go ahead and select this one. Are there any others like that? Yeah, the one right next to it. Like we just said, this is a tetrahedron, so one is going to be a wedge, one's going to be a dash. They're actually both going to be in the same environment, right? How about this one over here? I'd say it's definitely unique, right? Because it's the only one left. <laughs> so we've got three total proton signals that we would expect for ethanol. All right, number of carbon-13 signals. Two. I would say this carbon is definitely unique from that carbon. So I'd go ahead and I'd say, all right, that's got to have two carbon signals. Make sense? Yep. I think I understand what you're asking. You're saying, what if, let's say one of these is in a hydrogen, does that mean that the remaining two HAs will be in the same environment? I actually have an example that I'll show you later where that's not always the case. Usually it is, but not always. Okay, so let's try another one. All right, let's do a challenging one. This time I'm gonna kind of draw this differently. All right, and on the inside here, we have an aromatic ring. However, are those double bonds really stuck in between any two carbons? No. no. So oftentimes what I like to do to represent aromaticity is I just draw a circle in here to indicate that those pi bonds are actually delocalized around the entire ring system. So you might see that occasionally in your notes as well. All right, so same idea. How many proton signals? And then separately, I want you to determine the number of carbon-13 signals. And then check with your neighbor, because this one's a lot harder than the last one. I'm just going to draw these in, too.
All right, I'm going to stop you for one second. Let's, let's focus in on this CH3 group. Do you think all of these hydrogens are going to be the same? Yeah, like we said, it's going to be a mini helicopter blade. So in this case, I just condensed them down to CH3 groups, implying that they must be the same set of protons, right? All right, let's also consider over here. Okay, so my question for you is, do you think that these are in the same or different chemical environments? Same. Why the same? Yeah, so one student described this a few years ago where he said, well, actually all three of these are the same because it's like having a group of helicopter blades coming off of a helicopter blade, right? <laughs> so all of them are spinning around in space and they're just blurring out together. So all of these would be the same. So the group of helicopter blades analogy seems to work well. So I'm just going to highlight these as red. My question for you, are there any other protons that are in the same environment as those red box protons? On the top, right? Because we've got a plane of symmetry going on here. Okay, so what I would do is I'd say, all right, we've got these helicopter blades mirrored on the top half. Okay. Yep. I'm saying the ring system, but when it's like stuck like on on each side, then technically not. Oh yeah, sure. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> All right. So now the next one is let's focus in on this proton. Are these going to be the same? No, definitely not. One's coming off an aromatic ring, one's not. Okay, so let's go ahead and say, well, this proton, therefore, must be unique, right? Are there any others like it? Okay, I would say definitely this one, right? Because we said the top half is the same as the bottom half. What about over here? Yeah, absolutely, because we also have a vertical plane of symmetry. So over here, I would say that this one must be the same due to that vertical plane of symmetry. So now the question is, total number of proton signals? Two. Two. We've got the green protons that I've boxed, and we've got the red protons that I've boxed. So always watch out for these symmetry elements that you might run into. All right, carbon-13 signals, a lot harder. All right, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use my highlighter. And I'm going to say, all right, this carbon right here that I've highlighted in yellow, are there any others like it? Yeah, in fact, I would say these are going to be equivalent, right? Are there any others like those? The top CH3 groups. All right, so I'm going to say that all of those are going to be equivalent, those yellow highlighted ones. All right, now let's go over here, this orange one right here. Are there any others like it? Yeah, definitely on the bottom, so that would be my second. Okay, then I'd say, all right, what about this one? Yeah, I'd say on the bottom right there. And then I would go over here and I'd say, well, what about this one? I would say the remaining ones would actually all be equivalent due to that horizontal and vertical plane of symmetry, right? So now let's count up the number of carbons. How many do we have? Four. I will say students in the past get really confused. If color coding helps, absolutely do it on exams. In fact, I encourage color coding on exams if it helps you stay organized. I know mentally this is a lot of information to juggle. All right, are you ready for the ultimate challenge? All right. So this one's going to be a bit weird. So we're going to have two chlorines there. We're going to have a bromine down here that's off of the stereo center. It's going to be a wedge. Over here, I'm going to have a hydrogen and a hydrogen. And I'm just going to go ahead and draw in the remaining hydrogens. All right. So we've got all of the protons drawn in for this molecule, right? Don't be one of the people that shows a proton there. Why? That's a Texas carbon. There are no protons there, so don't be that person. All right. <laughs> Let's take a look at one of these. This one, I'll just label it HA arbitrarily. Are there any others exactly like it? What about the one down here? 
Well, let's think about it. Do we have a plane of symmetry cutting this in half? No, no, not anymore because the chlorines and bromines broke that symmetry. So I definitely say that this would be different. So I'll call this HB. Uh, what about this one right here? Are there any others like it? No, because again, we don't have any symmetry elements right now. So I'd say HC, and then over here, I'd say HD. All right, so we definitely have those four as unique protons. Now the challenge for this one is, do you think these are going to be the same or different? So talk with your neighbor and see if you can argue your way through this. All right, has everybody sufficiently argued? <laughs> All right, so let's get back together. Let's see a show of hands. Raise your hand if you think they're in the same environment. Raise your hand if you think they're in a different environment. Oh, this is good. Good debate. 50-50. All right, so does anybody want to explain why they're in different environments? What do you think? Ooh. All right. So let me see if I can rephrase this back to you correctly. So you said that this bromine is closer to this hydrogen. Another way of saying that is they're sin to one another, right? This hydrogen back here is actually anti to that bromine. Can we spin this around in space? No, it's in a ring system, right? So if we look at this, we'd say no. One is sin to bromine. The other, anti. No rotation possible. All right. So with that in mind, we could say, well, this must be, we already did A, B, C, D, E, and F. So how many protons would we expect here? Six. All right, this gets tricky. So, yeah. The hydrogen with the bromine? Oh, shoot. Holy cow. You caught me on my own mistake. The C, D, E, F, G. We would have seven. I forgot about that little guy. All right, so we've got seven total signals. Thank you, Pedro. You're keeping me honest. I like that. All right, <laughs> so this gets a little bit tricky. I'll show you a few tricks for managing all of this. All right. Pick two protons. But switch one to a deuterium. All right, so let's do the above example. So I'm just going to copy that molecule down below, and what we're going to do is we're going to focus exclusively on two protons. Typically I do this when I'm kind of stuck. So I'm going to pick one of these protons right here, and I'm going to switch one to a deuterium. Make sense? All right. And then you want to draw a pair, a pair, excuse me. So again, I'll do this over here. But this time, for the molecule I'm comparing, I'll make the dashed one the deuterium. 
and the front one a hydrogen. Does that make sense? So really, I just picked one of them here and made it a deuterium, and then on the other one, I did the opposite. Make sense? All right, so now my question for you. What's the relationship between these two molecules? Well, let's think about it, right? This stereocenter with bromine hasn't changed, right? What about this stereocenter up here, where the hydrogen and deuteriums are coming off? Did we change that? Definitely. So we flipped one of the stereocenters, but not all of them. What does that mean? Diastereomers, absolutely. So what that means is that the protons being compared are diastereotopic. And when this happens, they will show up differently. All right, what do you think they're called if we make a pair of enantiomers? Enantiotopic. Enantiotopic protons actually will show up the same under most NMR circumstances, with one exception. If you're running your sample in a chiral solvent, they'll actually show up differently. But for right now, we're not going to get into these weird examples. We're going to focus on this one because this is hard enough. So just keep in mind, if you're ever stuck between two protons and you do this trick where you draw both possible options out, where you swap one with the deuterium and you're making a set of diastereomers, they're going to be diastereotopic and therefore unique. Sometimes students are like, this just confused the heck out of me. I understand the sin anti thing. If that works for you, stick with that one. Yep. The double bond for the aromatic ring. Oh, sorry. Thank you. So I forgot my double bonds for the ring system. Thank you. All right. How many of you feel pretty confident with this? How many of you want more practice with this? Both? <laughs> yep. That's a good question. So the question is, well, what does the NMR spectrum look like? Yeah. Let's do baby steps. Because <laughs> what I've seen is when I throw NMR spectra at people all at once, it overwhelms a lot of people and their brains just shut off. So right now we're just going to break it down into elementary components. And then I'll show you the spectrum. Okay. Yeah. So I hate to do that, but we'll just pa pause for right now. All right, let's do one more practice. So this will be kind of our warm-up for our pod. I want you to help me determine the number of proton signals and the number of carbon-13 signals that you would expect for NMR. It's important to remember that those pi bonds and these aromatic rings are not localized, meaning they're evenly distributed. So if it helps you when you're just visualizing this to draw a circle on the inside, go ahead and do that too. Because sometimes people see those double bonds and they get really fixated on the double bonds when really they're not double bonds, they're more a bond and a half being delocalized evenly around the ring system.
All right, let's try the first one. So over here, are there any other protons like HA that I've listed? Let's imagine. Over here, is this proton going to be in the same space? Yeah, when it looks one side, it sees a proton. The other side sees a proton. So I'd say this is the same. Another way of thinking about this is there's a plane of symmetry, right? All right, what about this one? It's going to be the same too. In fact, we have rotational symmetry, right? So all of these are actually going to be the same. So how many signals would we get? One. So we get one proton signal. All right, how many carbon signals then? One. Because again, we've got rotational symmetry. So that's not too bad, right? We'd get one signal for each. All right, let's try the next one. All right, so over here, I'm just going to box these because we know methyl groups are going to be the same. Are there any others like that one? Yeah, again, we've got symmetry. Symmetry elements don't have to be vertical or horizontal. They can be diagonal as well. So I'd say those are going to be the same. All right, what about over here? Is this proton going to be the same? No, because it's coming directly off the aromatic ring. So I'm going to call this one down here HB. We'll call these ones HAs. All right, are there any others like HB? Yeah, I'd say on the other half of that symmetry line. What about down here? Are these the same? No, because if we think about HB right here, it's in between a hydrogen and a methyl group. This proton down here is in between two hydrogens. So very unique space. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and label this HC. All right, so now if we go ahead and we count all of these, I'm counting three unique proton signals. Make sense? All right, so now let's go ahead and identify the number of carbons. How many carbons do you think we have? So I'd say this set is unique, right, because of symmetry. Then over here we'd say, all right, that's going to be two. And then over here we've got three. And then over here we've got four. So we'd have four carbon signals. Make sense? All right, last one. Over here, I'd say, all right, this is going to be HA. Are there any like it? Yeah, in fact, I would cut this in half that way and say, well, this is going to be a symmetry element. So we're going to have both of these being equivalent, right? Because they're mere images of one another in space. All right, and then over here, are there any others like this one? No, we don't have any other symmetry elements, so that will be unique. And then what about this one right here? Are there any others like it? Yeah, the one on the bottom right here. See how those are mirror images of one another? So I call this HC and HC. And then last but not least, we've got this leftover. So we've got one, two, three, four proton signals. All right. And then last but not least, let's do the carbons. So over here, start with this one. And I'd say, well, these carbons are mirror images, right? Then I'd say three. Then I'd say, all right, four. These ones would be five. And then I actually need a new color. I'll do pink down here. Oh, I guess that's kind of like purple. Whatever. We get the idea. <laughs> that's going to bug me, though. So let's go ahead and change this to blue. So down here, we have one, two, three, four, five uh, carbon signals, right? So the cool thing with this is let's imagine looking at both of these molecules with IR, right? If we look at both of these with IR, are they going to look different by IR? Or do you think they're going to be pretty much the same? Pretty much the same, right? If we look at both of these using mass spec, do you think they'll look the same or different? Pretty much the same, right? So that then the problem is, well, if they look the same by IR and mass spec, how can we tell them apart? NMR. All of a sudden, we've got a tool where we can predict and distinguish which one is which based on NMR and clear up any confusion. What's the relationship between these? Constitutional They're constitutional isomers. So we can actually differentiate a lot of these by using simple clues in NMR, which is a hugely <clears throat> valuable tool. So what I want you to do tonight is to work on that problem of the day. You can get started now if you want. And then tomorrow when we come in, we'll address Eric's question. What do these actually look like? And start building and expanding upon this. But for right now, I just wanted to introduce this clue because people get tripped up by it. <laughs>